Okay, why don't we get started? Please grab a seat. Welcome to another installment of the Ethics Law and Society Forum. Uh, since we might have some new people here today, let me just invite anybody who wants to learn more um, about what we're doing here at SSU on the Ethics Law and Society front. Um, to come contact me about the Center for Ethics Law and Society uh, for more information. Uh, you can come up to me at the class. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be introducing this week's speaker. Uh, Cindy Cohn is the legal director and general counsel for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And what that means is that she oversees general legal strategy as well as supervising um, their staff attorneys. She graduated from the University of Michigan Law School after attending the University of Iowa and the London School of Economics. Um, prior to joining the Electronic Frontier Foundation, she was a civil litigator in private practice focused on technology, and before that, um, she worked for the uh, United Nations Center for Human Rights um, in Geneva, Switzerland. Past issues she's covered include uh, reader privacy, electronic voting, and even Sony's digital um, rights mm -hmm. management software. And currently she's tackling the NSA's warrantless surveillance program, permanent gag orders on uh, internet service providers, and computer fraud and abuse. Outside of the, uh, the courtroom, she has testified before Congress. She's been featured in numerous publications, including the New York Times and the San Francisco Chronicle. And she has achieved one of my lifeless dreams of having a conversation with Stephen Colbert. Uh, <laughs> exciting. Um, and for all this impressive work, she has been um, given numerous awards and honors, including having been named one of the um, 50 most influential women lawyers in America and one of the 100 most influential lawyers period in America. Um, so we're really privileged to have her here today. Uh, please join me in welcoming Cindy Jones. Thank you. Thanks for coming inside on this beautiful day. I guess it's Sonoma, so it's it's like that all the time here. But it was foggy in the city. Um, uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit today about the NSA spying, give you some basics about what we know about what the NSA is doing, tell you a little bit about what EFF is doing, um, and then also encourage you to think about what you might be able to do to help us if you agree with me that this is a problem we should address. I am an advocate. I am not a professor. I am not a, in the same place. I'm, I'm here to try to change things. And so I'm going to be open with you. My goal is to try to get you to think you need to help us try to change things by the end of this. Um, so here's what we're going to talk about uh, roughly. Um, we're going to talk about the collection uh, that the NSA is doing from the Internet backbone. I'll explain what that means. We're talking about the collection of your telephone records that the NSA is doing. We'll talk about a few more things. Uh, we're not going to talk about something called the PRISM program, which is where the government goes to your providers like Google uh, and Microsoft to get information. We're not going to talk about Internet metadata. Um, or foreign collection. I'm happy to answer questions about those, but I only had a few minutes and I had to decide what to talk about and what not to. Um, the overarching theme of what the NSA has been doing with your data is, in my mind, turning everything, our basic arrangement between people and their government upside down. Um, the basic arrangement that we have with our government is usually that if you aren't doing anything to draw suspicion or probable cause, you can go on your merry way and the government doesn't have access to what you're doing all the time. And it's only once the government can have some kind of targeted basis to go after you that the government gets the ability to have access to information about you, either from you directly or from your service providers. What the NSA has been doing for the last 15 years is turning this upside down. They're collecting everything first and analyzing second what they actually need. Um, this is with the phone records. This is with PRISM. Um, and then what they're saying is that, well, don't worry about the fact that we're having access to everything first because we don't keep it all. Uh, we get rid of it all uh, pretty quickly except for what we actually need, um, which basically means that they have the right to grab everything first, and then you have to trust that after they have access to everything, they're only going to keep the stuff that you and I would really agree that they need. Now, there's some problems with that. Number one, um, what they actually need is secret. <laughs> um, and number two, their methods have been proven to be somewhat leaky. And number three, I think there's a fundamental problem in our relationship to our government when laws don't protect us and the Constitution doesn't protect us. Instead, what we have to rely on is that the government's internal procedures, by the way, that are secret, will protect you. 
Um, and there was actually a quote by the U.S. Supreme Court just this past June uh, that I think speaks to the problem with the government's argument. And, and, and what in this case called Riley versus California, which you might have heard about, uh, the Supreme Court said that just because the cops pull you over doesn't mean they get to search your entire cell phone. They still have to get a warrant with probable cause and have a specific reason uh, to search your cell phone and only look for specific things. And as part of that fight, the government said, well, don't worry, even though we could theoretically search the whole phone, we're going to, we, we've implemented some protocols that mean that the police can't really, won't really do that in practice because they'll break their, their rules if they do. And the Supreme Court said the founders did not fight a revolution to gain the right to government agency protocols, which I think is the Supreme Court saying the same thing I just said, which is our protection should come from law, public law. They should come from the Constitution. They, couldn't, they shouldn't come from secret things that we can't see, and they shouldn't come from interagency rules. So this is the, we're going to talk about kind of four legal things. I promise you I won't go very deep into the law, but I think understanding that the, the contours of it will help you uh, as you think about whether you're okay with this and as you, uh, as I hope you will do, is help talk about this among your friends and your, and your family and your relatives about some of these arguments. We're going to talk about the Fourth Amendment a little, a little bit of the First Amendment, a little bit of Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act, and a little bit of the Patriot Act. Um, Here's, uh, in case you, you, you know, I told you that my view is that they want to collect it all uh, first and sort it out second. Um, here's one of their slides, so you can kind of see where I got that idea from. Um, this is one of the internal slides. This is actually about a foreign collection, um, but you can see this strategy of the government very clearly what their idea is, is that they're going to collect it all, know it all, collect it all. Uh, that's, that's, so, so that's, that's where I based my conclusion from. I didn't make it up. I just stole it from their slides. So let's talk a little about the Fourth Amendment first, because um, I think that's where people start thinking about their privacy vis-a-vis vis -vis the government. They start with the Fourth Amendment. Um, and let me give you just a little bit of Fourth Amendment law. Um, uh, the question is, the question that the law is going to ask about whether the Fourth Amendment protects what you do is, is it a search or a seizure? Is what the government doing a search or a seizure of your data? Um, uh, if there is a search, then the government needs to get a warrant. And a warrant means they have to go to a judge, they have to establish probable cause, which is a very high standard to believe that they think you've done something wrong and what that thing is, and just about you, not about like whole huge rafts of people. So it's clear that the NSA's mass spying, where they're hoovering up tons of your telephone records or tons of your communications, they're not getting a warrant because they couldn't meet the warrant standard for hoovering up stuff more broadly. So if it's a search or a seizure, then you get a warrant or there's an exception that applies. And there's a bunch of exceptions and really the fight that you're going to see probably in the courts is going to have to do with these exceptions. Um, but that's the standard for the Fourth Amendment. And I would argue that when the government has access to your phone records, they've seized them. And when they look through them to try to find patterns, they've searched them. Uh, on the telephone records, we'll talk about this a little bit more, the government's argument is it's not a search or a seizure because it's not the content of your calls, it's just the records. Uh, on, the, on the other one, we'll talk as we get through, we're talking about the programs, they argue it's also not a search or a seizure. But this is the framework you need to think about when you're thinking about what the NSA is doing in the Fourth Amendment. Um, now, the Fourth Amendment comes from a very particular time in history. It comes from a problem that the colonists were facing uh, it, just prior to the revolution, which was that the British troops were getting what was called a general warrant where they could search anybody's house they wanted to. They, they would go to a judge and they'd say, somebody isn't paying their taxes. Um, you might remember the Boston Tea Party was a revolt around paying of taxes, right? Um, they would say, somebody's not paying their taxes. There's been a crime committed we get this general warrant. And with this general warrant, they could search through anybody's house they wanted to. They got to pick who the suspects were. Um, and the Fourth Amendment was written um, after a lawyer uh, in, the, in the revolution. This is a picture of this uh, James Otis, is the lawyer here, who was an early uh, uh, a member of the um, revolution. He was a lawyer, and he tried to sue against these general warrants. And he said, look, this isn't fair. 
you can't just get a warrant because somebody committed a crime. You need to get a warrant that identifies who it is and, is, and shows probable cause that this particular person got a crime. And they t he brought two cases in England challenging these things. These are called general warrants. Um, and he lost. And he lost both of those cases. And the British Crown, the British court said, no, that's perfectly fine. These general warrants are perfectly fine. Um, and John Adams, who you may know was one of the founders of our country and our second president, said it was at James Otis's loss of the case against general warrants that the child independence was born. This is one of the very core reasons why we have a country today and we aren't a British colony. So when I talk about the need to specify who did something wrong and the fact that you can't just have the government scooping everything up more broadly and then sorting out second what they need, I think this is a good idea. I think it's a way to protect our privacy. There's a very specific root in the history of our country, which I think makes it really important that we think hard about whether we're going to toss this out the window. So the other thing I think about the massive collected all mentality is it has a problem, causes a problem for the First Amendment. The First Amendment is your right to freedom of speech. Um, it's also your right to freedom of association. And one of the core cases uh, from the 1950s around the right of association is a case called NAACP versus Alabama. Uh, this is during the civil rights era. The NAACP was an organization that helped organize the African American community to try to deal with Jim Crow and discrimination. Things were happening, a big problem in the 50, 1950s. And um, the government of Alabama didn't like them very much, and they didn't want them coming down and organizing the African Americans who lived in Alabama to say, wait a minute, this isn't fair, we shouldn't have separate, uh, we shouldn't have separate facilities, we shouldn't have separate schools. Um, the Supreme Court, the state of Alabama said, NAACP, if you want to come operate here in Alabama, you need to turn over your membership lists to us. And this, the NAACP challenged this, and they took it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said no. That violates your First Amendment right of association. Because if the government knows everybody who is a member or who associates with the NAACP, it's going to it's gonna mean that nobody's going to join. Nobody's going to put a big target on their back and make it be seen that they're joining this organization that is so disfavored by the state. This is still very good law. Um, this idea that if the government knows who you talk to, who you associate with, and who you're organizing with, uh, that would cause a problem in your exercise of your freedom of expression. Um, in the Prop 8 case here in California, there was a question about revealing people who were supporters of Prop 8 who had signed petitions saying that Prop 8 should be on the ballot. Prop 8, you may remember, is the gay marriage proposition that the Supreme Court found unconstitutional just a couple years ago. But even in that case, this, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is where we are here, said... You know, your right to associate means that your right to say whether, that your right to, for people to know whether you support this proposition or not should be protected because people aren't going to stand up for things that they believe in if they think that that information is going to go to the government or to their enemies. So the, the, the standard for the First Amendment is if there's a likely chilling effect on you joining association, if you're likely not to join an association based on what the government's doing, then the government has to meet a very high standard uh, we call it strict scrutiny in the law before they are able to get this information from your associations. Uh, so what's happening when the government collects everybody's telephone records? Well, they know everybody who you talk to. They know everybody who you associate with. And sure, that means they know how often you talk to your mom, but they also know whether you talk to people in Occupy. They also know whether you talk to people who may be, um, uh, may be in Yemen. They know whether you talk to your cousins who are maybe overseas someplace. They know how often you talk to them, when you talk to them, and, and the patterns of your communications. And actually, that, those patterns can be very, very powerful. They can tell very, very intimate details about you, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. So I think the First Amendment is implicated. I think just as giving your membership list, uh, the, the NAACP's uh, membership list to the government was a problem, Right now, what the government's doing, which is collecting normals membership lists, collecting students for sensible drug policies membership lists, collecting the membership lists of people for the American Way and Amnesty International and Greenpeace, it's the same problem that the NAACP faced in the 1950s. The second, the, the, so there's a couple of statutes. We'll just talk briefly about those. The FISA Amendments Act is the basis upon which the government claims that it can access 
information in the fiber optic cables. I'll explain that in a little bit, but this is the law that, that allows them to do that. One thing to remember about this statute was that the statute actually doesn't say that the government gets to collect everything. Um, it just says the government can do targeted collection of people who it believes are abroad. Um, and the government has taken this idea that it gets to do targeted collection and, and used it to allow itself to do untargeted collection. And I'll talk about that in a second. Just want to pass over the statutes and then I'll go into the facts and then we can bring it back together. Um, the FISA Amendments Act, uh, uh, Section 702, the FISA Amendments Act, is, this is one of the slides, uh, the ugliest slides ever that were uh, leaked by Mr. Snowden of internal uh, NSA uh, presentations. And you can see uh, what I'm going to talk about is the access to the fiber optic cables. Oh yeah, I have a little thingy. Uh, is a uh, is this upstream, C collection of communications from the fiber optic cables, and PRISM, collection from the servers of the companies. That's what Section 702, the government thinks, lets it do. I disagree. Um, the one thing about Section 702, this upstream collection that you'll hear the government say, is that, well, we're only looking for uh, foreigners' information. We're only doing collection that's aimed at foreigners. Um, the thing that makes that argument hard to accept is this map that was leaked also that shows the places, Fairview is one of these mass collection programs, where they're doing the collection from. And you know, I grew up in Iowa, which is this state right here, and you get to California, you may not know about the middle of the country. Um, that's not near the border. Just trust me on this. I grew up there, it's nowhere near the border. This doesn't look like what foreign collection would look like. And so I think the government's argument that this is aimed at foreigners is really pretty difficult to swallow when you look at where they're doing these collections. So how does this backbone surveillance that I've been talking about work? This is a, 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 a diagram that we created at EFF and we presented to a federal judge about this. Um, and let me explain how this works. So I'll do it over here. Um, so here's you guys. Um, our clients are AT&T customers, but honestly, this isn't very much different if you're Verizon or Sprint or T-Mobile or anybody. Um, but we know about AT&T because we have the internal documents about how this works. So here's the AT&T customers. Here's all the people who aren't on AT&T who they're talking to. And the way the internet works, some of you guys are computer science -y type folks. How many people here are technical computer science -y type folks? A few. Um, what, what happens is that your communications go through your ISP and ultimately, if they're headed to somebody who's a Verizon customer or another customer rather than an AT&T customer, how many people here have AT&T as their broadband? Yeah. How many people here have Verizon? Yeah. So it's a mix, right? Um, it, it, at, the, at the juncture where these things pass off from one provider to another, those are called the backbone junctures usually. Um, the peering networks is actually what the, the technical term is for them. Um, um, what the government has done is they've installed a very simple technical device called a splitter. Um, a splitter is, so you may have seen the commercials, you know that your communications travel on fiber optic ca cables. They actually travel on a beam of light. I don't know if you've seen these commercials about the light and intel inside and all that. Um, so what a fiber optic splitter does, it's a really simple device. I always give a little bit of tech and a little bit of law in these talks. A fiber optic splitter splits that beam of light into two. And the cool thing about light is that when you split light in two, you don't get halvesies. You get a full copy of everything that's been carried on that light, give or take a little bit, but for our purposes, a full copy of it. So what have they done? At these key junctures, they've installed fiber optic splitters. The splitters split the light. One copy of the light goes to its destination here across the top. Another copy of the light goes down here into government control. Um, by the way, this is one of the reasons why when your friends or your, your family members or your great aunt may tell you that they heard clicks on their phone and so they think that means they're being listened into or there was, there was strangeness happening as they were sending emails and they think that may mean the government's listening. Um, the answer is probably not because splitting light doesn't make a click. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean they're not being listened to. It means that the government's technologies are significantly better than they were in the 1960s when they had to put alligator clips on things and it did make a clicking sound. The, the light doesn't make a sound when it splits. 
So you get a copy of it going to the place it goes. You get a copy of it going into the government control. And then what does the government do? The government filters it to a certain extent. This is their own description of what they do. They do some rudimentary filtering. We don't know how that actually works, but we're giving them the benefit of the doubt. And then they search everything that's left. This includes content and non-content. It includes everything, because the fiber optic cables carry your web searches, they carry your Gmail, they carry your Skype, they carry basically everything you do. They also carry a lot of your phone calls, because phone calls, while they, they travel over the phone networks at a certain level, most of the time they go back onto the internet because it's cheaper for the phone companies uh, on the back end. So then they, they do all of this filtering, uh, then they search it for selectors, that's their term for, you know, Osama bin Laden or whoever else they're looking for, the members of the Occupy movement or whoever else. And then what? Th then they throw out the stuff that they don't want and then they keep it in the government database. Um, and the, one of the big arguments we're having with the government right now is that the government says that it's not until here that anything counts for purposes of whether they violated your constitutional rights. And my argument is it actually counts here. It counts when your communications are doing something other than what you want with them without probable cause. Um, but that's, a, that's a, a, a snapshot of what we think is going on with the surveillance. Actually, most of this is, there's really very little of this that hasn't been admitted by the government, except that the splitters are in the AT&T building on Folsom Street, which is where we have evidence from. They haven't admitted that. They've said, well, we're doing this. We have access to the fiber optic cables. We have all of this. But we can't tell you what companies they are. It's just a lot of the big companies that carry things. But we can't tell you which ones they are because that's a national security secret, um, which I think doesn't pass the giggle test at this particular time. We know who carries our communications. And if the government isn't morons and they're getting access to everything, that collect it all slide, it has to be AT&T and Verizon. They carry the vast majority of our stuff. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's how we think the unconstitutional search and seizure from the backbones. Is, is, be, is occurring. And let's talk about the telephone records. People, have you people heard about the collection of telephone records? That was the very first document that Mr. Snowden leaked was an order proving that the government is collecting everybody's telephone records. So this is what the order said. Um, all call, the important part here is that all call the hotel records is what they're collecting, not targeted. They're saying that this is authorized by Section 215 of the Patriot Act. Section 215 of the Patriot Act, on its face, just allows the government to collect tangible things relevant to an authorized investigation and no broader than a grand jury subpoena. What's notably missing from that language is everything. You get to collect all. You don't find all in that statute at all. And in fact, you find relevant to an authorized investigation, which may make you think it's less than all. In fact, I think it does. Um, so I don't think this statute supports the collecting of all either. So what's the government say? As I told you before, the government says that when it comes to your telephone records, it's just metadata. It doesn't tell you anything about the content of your calls. It just says who you call, how often you call them, and do them. Um, this is a little slide. These are just some of the ones that we came up with about situations in which who you call, what time you call, where, uh, and what time you call are going to be pretty much tell you what's going on in the story without actually the content. In fact, the content of some of these uh, communications may not give you any information at all because it might be, hey, yeah, meet you there, or I'm about to do it. Um, if you want more of these examples, there's a declaration by a Princeton professor named Ed Felton in a case called ACLU versus Clapper where he lays out more of these situations. So this idea that it's just your telephone records and so it can't tell very much about you, these are just a couple of examples. You can spend five minutes and come up with 20 more. Um, your metadata matters. And in fact, it matters so much to the government that we did have the head of the, the director of national intelligence admit that you know they kill people based on metadata. Drone strikes are based on metadata. They're based on people who are, they believe are at a particular place at a particular time and they hope that they get the right person. Now it turns out they're not very good at that, but it doesn't stop them from launching the drone strike. So I think the argument that this has nothing to do with your privacy and they can't possibly implicate anything personally about you by collecting your telephone records really doesn't pass the giggle test. So what's EFF doing? Well, we're involved in several cases challenging the telephone records. Uh, there are three right now. Uh, uh, 
that are active, one in the D.C. Circuit, one in the Second Circuit, which is in New York, and one in the Ninth Circuit, which is here, which was brought by a mom in Idaho who doesn't think that, uh, she's actually a nurse as well, uh, who doesn't think the government should access, have access to her telephone records. That case is called Smith versus Obama, and we're in the middle of briefing it now. Uh, we also have a case that's based on the First Amendment. I talked to you about the associations there. That case is called First Unitarian Church of Los Angeles because a church is an association as well versus NSA, where we have 23 organizations who banded together to say their First Amendment rights have been violated. And then we have a case called Jewel versus NSA, which actually has the phone records in it, but also has this T that I show you, showed you about the access to the fiber optic cables in it. <coughs> so those are the two big programs uh, that I want to talk about, but that's not all the NSA is doing. We've learned quite a bit in the last year, uh, year and change about what they're doing. And some of the stuff they're doing is very, very troubling. Uh, we know that they are inserting vulnerabilities into our systems. They're trying to break our encryption. They're trying to break the security that you guys rely on, not just to protect yourself from the government, to, but to protect you from malware, to protect you from bad guys, to protect you from, from, uh, from identity theft uh, and other sorts of problems. Uh, we know that they are, uh, those of you who are computer scientists who may end up being systems administrators, there's a, a whole set of slides called I, I Hunt Sysadmins that demonstrates that the NSA is using your tax dollars to attack you, to try to find places where you might have done security wrong or you might have made a mistake and to exploit those holes. Um, and we know that they have been doing things like faking being Facebook and other, and Google and other apps in order to install malware on people's computers. Uh, and, and catch things like them typing in their passwords and other things. So what are, what are we doing at EFF? We're a small nonprofit based in San Francisco. We're in the Tenderloin uh, with about 60 people. We are engaged in litigation, as I mentioned, the Smith case, the Jewell case, and the First Unitarian case, the cases that we are bringing right now, try to challenge this in the courts. We're involved using the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, which is a law that helps you try to pry information out of the government. A lot of the information that the government has released about their spying uh, right now <coughs> comes as a result of the FOIA cases that we've done or that our colleagues at the ACLU or EPIC have done. Uh, we involved in amicus briefs. Amicus briefs are a way that you can, be a, you can file a brief in a court case where you're not a party and explain the broader uh, ramifications of those, and we've participated in those as well. Uh, in terms of the lawyers at EFF. Uh, there's also been some legislation that has been proposed. The current one is called USA Freedom, which uh, is a tiny, tiny baby step. It has to do only with Section 215, only with the telephone records collection part of what I've talked to you about, including uh, in terms of substantively changing things. And what it would do is it would mean that the government doesn't collect your phone records anymore. It allows the phone companies to keep them but still lets the government have pretty ready access to them in the hands of the phone company. So it's a baby step, but we think it's useful. It also has some transparency uh, and some reform of the FISC. We didn't talk about the FISC, but that's a secret court that approves uh, national security investigations. And I, I can talk about that further if people have questions. Um, so it has three kind of changes. Uh, we're nervous about it because it has a lot of wiggle room in the language, but uh, but it is a first step, and our view is that getting at least some legislation to go against the NSA right now, given how powerful they are and how long they've held sway in Congress, would be a good first step and would demonstrate to members of Congress that we can actually make some change here. Uh, so we support it. It's possible that it's going to get gutted in the next couple of weeks, in which case we will oppose it. So pay attention to that. Um, internationally, one of the things I didn't talk about very much is the foreign collection. I told you we weren't going to talk about that, but believe me, what the NSA is doing in terms of mass collection here is actually small compared to do it, what they're doing with the mass collection all around the world. And the rest of the world is pretty unhappy about the fact that the NSA basically views them as fair game for spying. Uh, we wrote, along with a whole bunch of organizations around the world, a set of proposals called Necessary and Proportionate.net these 13 principles for uh, mass surveillance around the world um, that are trying to rein in um, all the countries of the world. It's not just the U.S. government that's engaging in the mass surveillance um, 
of, of people around the world. And one of the problems that I think we face as, as a country is even if you think it might be okay for the NSA <laughs> to engage in mass surveillance of people all around the world, once you open that door, that means every country in the world is going to want the right to do the same thing. And most of them are pretty close to having the technical ability. We're still ahead. But if the USA is going to spy on people all around the world, the government of China is, already is doing a lot of it, the government of India, the government of Ethiopia, which EFF is suing for spying on an American citizen in Maryland with impunity uh, recently. It's just a race to the bottom in terms of your privacy. Even if you, So even if you think the NSA could be trusted here, I think there are broader concerns about that path. Uh, we've also been involved in some things at the European Court of Human Rights, the ECHR, and the Organization for the American States, which is the Americas stuff. So those of you who are interested in the international stuff, I'm happy to talk about that a little further, too. Uh, EFF has developed technology. I think some of you heard my colleague, Cooper Quinton, when he came here a little while ago, working on some uh, anti, some privacy stuff. Uh, some of the stuff that I think is most useful for people who are worried about the NSA is something called HTTPS Everywhere. Uh, you know that it's a Firefox and Chrome plugin that makes sure that when you type in a website, you actually go to that website as opposed to somebody faking. When I, you know, I told you they're faking being Facebook, and so that they can install stuff. The way that they do that is by putting up a fake website that looks like the real website. HTTPS, so you know when you type in a website, you write HTTP colon slash slash. You probably don't have to do that very much in the modern browsers because it does it for you. But you do EFF.org. Um, Unless you have the S on there, somebody could pretend to be EFF and then capture your information based on that. HTTPS makes that much, much harder for someone to do. The SSL Observatory is kind of a deeply geeky way of trying to make also make sure that the websites you go to and the information you give to them, that you can trust that you're really where you think you are. Um, this is a, a big problem, not only having to do with national security and governments, but also a lot of phishing sites that are trying to get your passwords or your credit card information. Well, fake themselves being, you know, your bank in order to capture this information. So both of these technologies don't just protect you against the NSA, they protect you against all the other bad, all the bad guys of the world. So that's my basic outline of things. Um, I think the fun part of this is a question, so I'm going to get to those quickly. Um, but my question for you is, you know, what can you do? Um, I always get this question, and if you're interested in helping, there's lots you can do. Um, right now, more Americans think the NSA has slid too far than think that what they're doing is the right thing. That's the first time since I've been working on this stuff, since 2006, that that's the case. So if you're concerned about this, congratulations, you're in the majority now. Um, I think that activism is an open source project. I think you just know best what you can do in your community to try to make this work, or what you could do on the internet to reach an international audience to try to do this. Um, there are several things that are useful. One is to tell your representatives. Who's your member of Congress up here? Huffman. Huffman? Mm -hmm. Where's he on this stuff? Um, it's hard to say. I'm a little more neutral, but, but leaning in this direction. There is actually, EFF has a, a, a know your, I should have put it in here, a know your congressman uh, website where you can type in the name of your representatives and uh, find out what kind of grade. We gave them a grade for where they are on these kinds of things. I will tell you, most members of Congress are trying to hide from this. So the most important thing you could do is tell your member of Congress that this matters, um, especially in the House. Uh, on the Senate side, I, I think that uh, Dianne Feinstein is one of the leading people on the wrong side of this, and I'm not sure we're going to change your mind, but it doesn't hurt to let her know. Barbara Boxer is one who's been hiding out a little bit, and it would be useful for her to come out and say the right thing, because I think she would lean in our direction as well on these things. But letting them know that this matters really is really important. We're coming up on an election, but the, this bill that I mentioned is going to come up again, I think, after the election. Um, letting your representatives know that this is something you care about is really important, because Right now, members of Congress are really running from fire to fire to fire and letting them know that this is something they can't just wave their hands at and it'll go away. It can be really important. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, allergies. Um, uh, there are tools that you can use to help protect your privacy. OTR means off the record. It's an instant messaging back end. The front end for OTR is called Pigeon if you're a Windows user. It's called Adium if you're a Mac user. And then there are some Linux ones as well. 
It's a way to have secure instant messaging communications. It's a really good tool. It's open source. It's free. Jitsi is an open source tool that lets you uh, do like Skype or Google Hangout. You can do voice uh, and also texting and stuff. It's uh, still a little wonky, uh, a little janky to use, but it does work. Also free and open source. Download it. Uh, Tails is something you can use if you want a completely secure computer, and um, and uh, it's a very exciting tool if you need real uh, uh, grade security. Um, and PGP and GPG are uh, two products, one's open source and one's proprietary, that help you secure your email. All of them should have plugins for whatever you use. I will tell you, it makes your life a little harder to have these security tools. Um, but if you want to use them, you will help make them better, and especially if you want to feed into the projects and give people feedback about what's working and what's not, that would be very helpful. Build the tools, teach others to use them. There's an event called Crypto Party. Have any of you heard of Crypto Party? Uh, Crypto Party is an event that uh, students are throwing all around the world where they invite each other in and teach each other how to use crypto. Uh, and um, EFFers, uh, a lot of our staff activists will help, can help throw crypto parties. There's how-tos on the, on the thing. It can be a fun way to kind of start a conversation among uh, your friends, especially your geekier ones, about how to do this. Very famously, there was a crypto party in Hawaii about two years ago where Ed Snowden came, uh, long before he was Edward Snowden. Um, uh, uh, well, he was always Edward Snowden, but long before he was uh, world-renowned, uh, to try to help teach people how to use these tools so they can protect themselves. Of course, support EFF and the other groups that are working to do this. A friend of our, our friends at the ACLU do a lot of work on this. There's a group, a local group in the Bay Area called Fight for the Fourth, um, and a bunch of other organizations that are working to try to make this, uh, make this, uh, these changes happen and keep this issue in the public eye. So, that leaves us a little bit of time for questions um, or a conversation. This is me, if you have questions. Please tell me where you um, met me, if you write me an email, because I'm a space cadet and I will forget. Um, but if you have questions, we also have at EFF a full-time student activist organizer named April, uh, who's trying to get groups on campus and, and can offer support if this is something you guys want to pick up and run with. If not, that's fine. Um, but you're going to live in the world that we build right now, and I think we're at a very important inflection point in terms of, you know, whether you guys are going to be able to have a private conversation uh, in the future or not. Any questions? There, and then we'll go back. So you mentioned, you know, you mentioned uh, for things like Google Chrome and Firefox and stuff like that. And I was just wondering, um, with, you know, with Google's privacy policy being, you know, kind of transparent in regards to information that, you know, I don't know if it's government related or if it's just what they sell to uh, third parties for, you know, putting ads on your web searches and stuff like that. How does that, how does that place Google Chrome in terms of being a safe browser? Um, I think that, um, well, first of all, these plugins are plugins that help make it's so that Google doesn't has less information about what you're doing. So the browser itself is a platform, um, and, and it will pass secure packets just as it'll pass insecure packets. So a lot of what we're doing is trying to help you put locks on the, you know, not right on postcards, but right on envelopes, right in envelopes, so that they can, come, they can go through the same network, but they're just protected. Um, Google is an interesting uh, company. Actually, Apple as recently as well. Um, they're feeling the heat from this idea that they, well, so there's a couple things you should know. The first thing is that Google is very interested in knowing very much about you. They're not interested in the government knowing very much information about you. So <laughs> while Google collects way more information than I'm comfortable with, and then EFF has a tool called Privacy Badger that Cooper works on and some other things to try to help protect you against that, Google's actually in domestic situations around the FBI been pretty tough on the government in terms of when they turn stuff over. Now, what we learned with Mr. Snowden was that when the national security people came in, it might have been a different story. Um, so we need to keep pressure on these companies to give us strong tools. Um, and we need to support them for standing up. So Google and Apple just announced uh, earlier this week that they were going to put disk encryption on your phones, which meant that when your data is sitting on your phone, it's not open and easy for the government to get access to. It's going to be encrypted. Um, and the FBI is freaking out and, and, and saying stuff. And 
Um, but the, the, you've had disk encryption on your laptops for a long time and your your desktop. So they're just matching this, recognizing that this is a computer too and matching the level of security. So giving them kudos when they do the right thing, but also pushing on them to give us more security uh, would be re is really, really important. Um, um, but I don't think all hope is lost. I don't think Google has an interest in being a conduit between you and the NSA. Google wants to know everything about you. Google doesn't actually sell your information to advertisers <laughs> either. They sell advertisers you without telling the advertisers who you are. So Google and Amazon are actually fairly protective of your privacy, not because they actually care about your privacy very much, but because they want to be the only place that advertisers can come to to find out as much information about you as they can. Facebook is another story. Facebook actually does leak the information out a lot. It's, their, their business model is different. I think they are more troubling in terms of your privacy than Google or Amazon at this point, but it's, it's not a fun race. Right? There was a law just passed that said you can't, or that basically prohibits companies from selling student information. Yes. Yeah, and, and, um, and I think students have extra protections under something called FERPA. Um, um, and I think there's some state law stuff as well to try to give you guys some protection. On the other hand, I know a lot of students who just use Google Docs with their regular old login. And so even though the institution is supposed to protect you, um, students, uh, a lot of students, I'm, I've seen this with high school students a lot, they're, they're really being pushed towards using tools that are not so protective because they're not using the educational version of the tools, they're using the regular one. So um, theoretically speaking, if we have relatives in another country that with, would they still watch the other person you're talking to very closely just because they're in a different country? Well, they're. So than they would in the United States. Yes. The government's position is that the only people who deserve any level of privacy protections are Americans, period. And so their argument is there's no, there's no constitutional protections for foreigners abroad, there's no statutory protections for foreigners abroad. And the basis upon which the government gets to spy on everybody abroad is this executive order that gives no protections whatsoever to people abroad. So um, the official legal position of the government is if you're not an American, they can spy on you with impunity. Um, let's see. Let's go here and then we'll go back over there. Um, what's your uh, view of the Patriot Act? Well, I think the Patriot Act as a whole is a very big act. It was one of these things that did a bunch of little things all over the place. I would say there's very little of the Patriot Act that I think is we couldn't do without. Um, there are some pieces having to do with aviation security and some immigration stuff, not the bad immigration stuff. There's some parts of the Patriot Act that were decent because they just did a grab bag of everything that all of these different agencies wanted after September 11th, put a little bow on it, called it Patriot, and Congress just passed it. So. I think most of the stuff that happened in the Patriot Act, I don't think we should keep. Um, repealing all of it, there's some pieces of it that's probably it's probably wise to keep. And so it's a, it's a nice slogan to repeal the Patriot Act, and I'm kind of down with it as a general rule. But I think, if, you know, as a lawyer, you kind of know all the pieces. And there's, there's only about, I would say, 90% of it that I would actually toss. Most of the stuff having to do with electronic surveillance law, though, I think we could fix. It's, it seems very clear, uh, well, it's, it, it's actually very clear, the 9-11 the report that happened, you know, there was a big blue ribbon report about what happened and how 9-11 happened. And the thing that the panel said very, very clearly was the government didn't need any new laws. They needed to enforce the laws that they had, and they needed to get rid of some of their internal regulations that kept them from sharing information. So they had internal regulations, and actually the CIA and the FBI hate each other. Um, always, have for the longest time. Um, this is an old, old fight. And it has to do with Harvard and Princeton and eating clubs and whatever. But the CIA and the FBI don't like each other very much, and so they weren't sharing information. So FBI agents had information about the 9-11 bombers, and they tried to get the CIA and the national security people to look at it. There's a woman uh, named Colleen Rowley who was in Minnesota. It was a very good example, and there's a couple more. Uh, and they just didn't share the information. They didn't recognize that these guys who they think are yin yangs that the FBI had something real here. And that's why they missed the bombers. Same with the, the spying. They claim that they needed uh, the ability to spy on uh, telephone records and the spying on people's phones because they didn't know that there was some guy in San Diego 
who was part of planning 9-11. But if you look at this story, and people have really debunked it pretty easily, they had all the information they needed this guy. They could have targeted him. Remember, the, the differences between mass spying and targeting spying, nobody's arguing that the government shouldn't have the ability to do targeted investigations if they've got probable cause. They have plenty of probable cause on this guy who was in San Diego, who was communicating regularly with a safe house in Afghanistan. Um, they just didn't act on it. So that's a long, sorry, I, I get excited about this. That's a long way of saying, I think that the, I think that most of the Patriot Act could be trashed without endangering national security, because I don't think we needed it in the first place. Uh, we had you over there, and then back. I was just wondering, I remember uh, when Senate panels really started about this, especially after uh, Snowden came out, uh, the government released a very thorough report on the Actually, they had to issue an apology and withdraw the statement. So if you follow it along, they basically uh, they basically were munging together a whole bunch of things and to come up with that 50 number, and then they dropped it down to 7, and then they dropped it down to 0 uh, in terms of these things. It turns out what they, what they have found is some actionable intelligence that they've handed over to our allies. So they gave some information to the British about some... Uh, sect that they thought might be gathering together stuff. Um, so there's been some actionable intelligence for foreign governments that's come out that um, so far those stories have held up, but honestly we haven't talked to the foreign governments about it very much. Just like everything that we can investigate falls apart. There's some stories left, um, but they they all, the ones that, that have been investigated, there was a report Cato did a, Cato did a report, there was another report where they really dug into these things and they all fell apart. They were all they were all situations where they might have found some stuff out as a result of, of their analysis, but it was all information that they either already had or could get with other techniques. Um, and, and now what they'll basically say is, well, this is a little quicker than our other techniques. That's the, that's the honest, best answer that they have. And then what a little quicker means is just nobody knows. And, and, and honestly, they're not being there. So they, but the, he had to withdraw that statement. <laughs> In the back. Um, on your chart, you know, you have like the five of these tables and you have the tea. Uh -huh. And lower down at the bottom, you were talking about how to go through a filter, uh -huh. like, what the government is interested in, and then everything else. Like, you know, they might search for you, you use like the Occupy Command or Osama Bin Laden or whatever they're looking for. Uh -huh. And then the rest of it gets thrown away. Uh huh. Does, what if they decide later on that there's a Honestly, I don't think they really throw it away at all. This is what they've told, this is what a federal judge has said they are doing, and they don't define thrown away. And I suspect that they want a time machine. I suspect that if they get information, they want to be able to go back. I think what they do, this is me guessing, I think that what, just and just from hanging out with computer people for a long, long time, like, Computer people are the worst pack rats in the world, right? They never want to get rid of a piece of data because it might become important later, right? And there's a whole, I, 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 I've joked for a long time that, you know, the worst pack rats I know aren't like grandmas. They're like the geeky people who design our systems. And, uh, and I love them all, but they tend to be pack rats. And so I suspect what they're actually doing here is they're moving stuff from one kind of memory that's easy to access and it's in their open memory, you know, kind of RAM, if you want to think about it on a computer, to, to something that's off-site storage and that they can, uh, they can uh, bring it back if they want to. And part of the reasons I think this is that after the Boston Marathon bombing, the, Sonar the, the Sarnefs, were not on, they had gotten a bunch of threats, but they, they'd gotten a bunch of reports from the Russians about these guys, uh, about the older brother. And um, they were able to reconstruct a whole bunch of information about these people uh, afterwards, that if it was true that they weren't a target beforehand, they shouldn't have been able to get under this story, right? So I, this is why I don't really believe them. What we did for purposes of this is give the government's best story. This is the best, to the extent that they've described this, this is their best story about how they've described it. And what I wanted to explain to the judge is, even if you take them at their best story, we've got constitutional problems here. Um, 
So I think two things. I mean, this is just me thinking, but I don't think that this filtering is actually aimed at just eliminating domestic transactions, and I don't think that this content search for selectors means that they throw out everything. Um, I don't think either of those things is actually true as a matter of action. Um, the government, we know, plays a whole bunch of word games <laughs> with things like collect and maintain and retain and all of that kind of stuff um, that I think may be going on here. I, I think we're out of time. Oh, sorry. So please run your thing. Thanks again.